Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Advanced Methods for Building Trade Systems. Today's presenter is CQG's product specialist, Helmut Mueller. Welcome, Helmut. Uh, hi, uh, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Tom, and thanks for having me. Great. Appreciate this. Uh, my name is Tom Hartle. I am CQG's Director of Product Training. I'll be your host and moderator today. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section window at any time during the presentation, and we'll have Helmut answer the questions at the end of the webinar. If you're viewing the presentation in full screen mode, you can find the Q&A in the WebEx toolbar at the top of your screen in the drop-down menu on the far right. If you're having any sound issues, please contact the host via WebEx chat. We'll be recording today's webinar, and it will be posted within 48 hours to the events section on news.cqg.com. All registered attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording. This webinar is a follow-up presentation to Helmut's previous backtesting webinar, Evaluating Trading Ideas with Intelligent Backtesting. If you are just starting to work with backtesting in CQG, you are encouraged to watch that video as well. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Helmut Mueller. Helmut joined CQG in 1997 as a customer service technician and within a year, he was promoted to CQG product specialist. He is based in Frankfurt, Germany, and he both works with CQG customers as well as training CQG employees throughout Europe. His expertise covers advanced option modules, trade system programming, designing chart conditions, developing custom studies, auto trading, and basically all other aspects of visualizing and testing trading theories. For the past year, Helmut has been posting backtesting tips and other topics in the trader's code column in the commentary section of news.cqg.com. Welcome, Helmut, and now we'll turn the webinar over to you. Uh, thank you, Tom, and um, hello again, everybody. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, um, I'm going to join my screen uh, with the O, uh, share screen. Uh, give me one sec. Uh, here we go, share my desktop. And um, as Tom already mentioned, um, this is a this is a follow up on the first seminar we did. So the idea really was on the first seminar showing people the necessary steps to how create a trading system, uh, what you expect from the outputs of the trading system, uh, and all uh, the ins and outs. A little bit about optimization and this, what you see on the screen. Um, today we follow up on that, and we already have a trading system on our screen. So I'm not going again through the uh, different steps of, uh, of how to get there, creating the trading system. We want to focus on uh, four little examples I um, pulled out out of the, um, of the trader's code column I uh, Tom mentioned before uh, to give you an idea how to do more advanced stuff in the software and a little bit tips and tricks on your hand, uh, how you can do certain things maybe a little bit quicker, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, more efficient um, than always going uh, to do the back testing module um, as such. So there's a little tips and tricks in there. So first of all, <clears throat> um, we're looking at um, the ATR. So um, one of the ideas is um, when you're entering a, a trade in a trading system, or technically if your system enters a trade, um, you always have to wait until uh, you get the next signal. So we're looking at the very simple moving average uh, system here. I'm assuming that up a little bit. Um, so uh, every time you get a signal here, so we had a crossover on the moving averages, and on the opening of the next bar, we actually enter our trade here. And then at the least possible, okay, we can have stop loss or profit targets, but normally you would have to wait at least to the end of this bar or to the next bar till the next signal can happen. So if you consider this, um, that you have to wait a bar, or sometimes if, if the signal doesn't occur, occur for the next couple of bars, uh, we can say we have an implied risk inside these bars. We can actually measure these risks. Um, I'm using uh, very often the pointer tool, the currency tool. So if we look at um, these bars, this is a very small bar from high to low, but if we, if we look at this big green bar here, if I just measure the, the value from the high to the low, 
of the bar, um, there, there's an implied risk in this bar of uh, $425 in training mini S&Ps uh, here in this example. Um, so, uh, and this is measured with one lot, uh, with one lot of course. So, <clears throat> um, the actual turtle system uses that technique of uh, measuring risk by the ATR, and I wanted to use that in, inside my trading systems as well to come up with a smart quantity of how much contracts I'm willing to trade, looking at the inside risk of those bars we are facing. Of course, I can just um, I develop this formula before I can just copy and paste the formula into the code. But the real idea here is on that uh, little section here to show how to get to this kind of formula and how to develop it yourself. Also, if you have some other ideas mathematically of things you want to do in CQG, how how you would come up with a formula like this uh, like this yourself. Um, that's the idea behind the first example. So here we have our uh, trading system we're looking at, the A2 trading system. And as mentioned before, it's exactly the trading system we have used before. And at the moment, it's, it's trading 27 lots per trade, uh, just as a, fixed, as a fixed rate. And we're making some uh, $110,000 um, uh, profit on that trading system at the moment. Now I want to develop um, a formula that takes all these fixed numbers of, uh, of trading sizes and change that into a um, flexible number of trades compared to my account size and to compare to the implied risk in those charts. To develop this formula, I could write the code directly into the, uh, into the size section of the trading system, uh, but I want to do a little side step here and create the formula in, um, in a custom study environment to actually show you the little steps um, to get to the right formula and a way to, to test that as well. Um, I click on you to create a new custom study, and in this case, I, I just call it my ATR. At the end of the day, it is something that has to do with ATR, but we do it like on a manual way. Okay, if I know, again, if I know the code, I can start typing here, but we really suggest people using our study. So the first thing I need, I want to measure uh, as I did on this large bar here, I want to measure the inside risk of those bars. So the best way to do that, uh, if you go to, um, to bar values, uh, to bar, we have the range of the bar, which automatically measures uh, from the high to the low in points, how many points the range would be. Um, or we also, um, uh, if you scroll down here, that list, Oh, let's move around. Uh, we can here, here we go. Sorry, <laughs> lost sight of it. Uh, we can also use true range. Uh, okay, what's the difference between a range and true range? Uh, if you have a gap opening in the mo in the morning, or if if there's a, the gap in the bars in, um, at some point, the true range would include the gap into the calculation, where the range just really takes the bar itself and calculates high to low. Uh, because ATR is based on, on the true range, also taking those gaps into consideration, we also would use the true range here. On normal situations, it would be the same value. We should see the same value like here. Um, only in gap situations, we should see different values. The first thing I do, I insert the true range into my uh, piece of code here. And um, what that does, I can, well, I can uh, create a toolbar button for my ATR. And I can immediately show that study while it's already in development, while I'm still working on the toolbox, uh, I can see the, the necessary steps and the output of the study um, at the time when I'm producing the actual study. So now if we look at the true range, and if I use the vertical cursor here, uh, I measure that uh, particular bar here, and the true range uh, is 8.5 points. So knowing that mini S&Ps are trading at uh, at $50 per point, so if you multiply that by 50, uh, we are exactly here on the 425 uh, box on that bar. So first step, <clears throat> understanding the true range, and I can see for each individual bar how many points actually the, um, the value or the implied risk of uh, each of those bars uh, is. The next step, because points doesn't really help, um, I want to, uh, display this information, not in points, I want to display this in money instead of points. There's a very neat function uh, in the function section of the toolbox. Um, 
<clears throat> it is called um, price to dollar. Uh, here we go. Or it's called, yeah, price to dollar is the actual code. And uh, you find the formula under price to native currency. The, this function actually understands the value uh, of each and every market. So if you're trading uh, mini S&Ps, that outcome would be dollars. If you're trading something on European markets, uh, on DAX, for instance, uh, it would be euros. And if you're trading UK markets, it would be sterling. So I can use the formula. And very smart in the toolbox, I just highlight the code I would like to use, the true range. And then I use the price to dollar function and apply it uh, to the true range. So if I hit apply in the toolbox here without even closing the toolbox, uh, the, the curve itself looks exactly the same, but now it's not showing eight and a half points anymore. Now it's showing the real value of that bar, or the what we say implied risk of that bar. Okay. Now because uh, I'm running that in a trading system, I want to smooth that down a little bit. So I don't want to uh, have these very um, spiky numbers here, like big high risk here and then low risk here. I want to smooth that a little bit, and that's, this is what ATR, the average true range, does. It actually applies a moving average to that um, calculation here. We're doing the same thing. I'm just highlighting the whole piece of code I created and looking in the study section uh, for a moving average. They are all alphabetically ordered. So I'm just going down uh, to the moving averages. Here we go, moving averages. And um, I can apply a simple 10 period moving average to it. Again, I highlight the code here. Uh, I select the, um, the piece of function I want to use, the moving average, and then I hit apply. So this way, the system takes care about the brackets and everything goes into the right order without me thinking, well, where, where do I go with brackets and, and so on and syntax all that thing. If I hit apply now, we can see how the curve actually smooths out and gives us like an implied risk over the last 10 bars, like on an average um, in dollars. So that's values, if we, if we call that curve here, uh, that's something around $200, and on low volatile areas, it goes down to $80, $85. Okay, now what does it help me on quantity? So I know now that there is some implied risk in that chart, but I actually want to come up with a trading quantity, so I want to reverse that. So, and I have the, um, uh, the following, uh, like, simple idea on that. Uh, let's assume uh, we have a trading account. Um, we, we want to trade up $250,000. Okay, I'm bringing that calculator over. So let's say we're trading $250,000 in our, in our trading account, and uh, we, we want to determine how much risk we can, we're going to take per trade. So a good rule of thumb maybe would be um, if you're a really aggressive trader and you know that your next trade would be good, you can risk it all. You can say, okay, I take an implied risk of 250000 but if your trade goes wrong, of course, all the money is gone and your trading account is lost. So a good rule of thumb might be um, to risk not more than 1% at the time. So 1% of 250000 is actually is actually $2,500. Per trade. This way, if you if you only risk two thousand five hundred, considering like stop losses and and profit targets and and implied risk, uh, you can make at least one hundred trades um, before uh, if it's all bad trades, if they all go wrong on the trades in a row, which is possible but not very probable, <laughs> then uh, then the trading account would, would be bust. And this is also the the way where you um, actually. Uh, change your risk parameters. If you want to be more aggressive, you can maybe risk 2 or 3% um, of your trading account per trade. And if you want to be more conservative, you can risk only 0.5% or 0.2% or something like that per trade. So that's totally up to you how aggressive uh, you want to be on the market. But as a rule of thumb, like 1% is a good, uh, good starting point. So now we know we have an implied risk here somewhere between $100 and, and $200 per trade, and we want to raise $2,500 to get this calculator out of the way. So now we can simply go and take the, going to the beginning of the formula, taking the $2,500 we are allowed to trade, and divide that by the calculation we have in place, okay? If I hit apply now, 
that curve actually reverses because now it's not giving us the risk anymore. It's $2,500 divided by the risk, and it gives me the number of contracts I would be able to trade at any point in time of the trading system. So if the trading system, just go in there for a moment, if the trading system moving average are crossing, we're facing a new trade, it would at that moment read uh, the figure and um, that calculation and would be able to trade 18 lots at this point. The number, because we're using smoothing here, the number is actually 18.18, so we need to do one little step here uh, to round that number down to the next integer, because we, of course we cannot trade 18.18 future contracts. Uh, you, would, you would have been mixing with options or something. So we want to always run that down, because we never want to overdo our risk. Uh, we always want to round it down and do less risk than, um, than calculated. Again, for rounding down, under the function section, you'll find something interesting. Um, the function is called floor. So we have a ceiling and we have a floor. And floor always rounds it down to the next possi uh, possible integer, like a um, flat number. So again, highlighting the whole piece of code, hitting apply, and now this should be a little bit scattered and doesn't have any decimals anymore. So if you look into the lower left corner here, of the chart, so it's now either, either trading 11 or 10 or 9 or 10, 12 contracts, depending on the on the point in the chart. So now, as we created the formula, uh, now I can simply take the whole whole formula by copy and paste, uh, go to the clipboard, use copy, go back to my trading system, and to compare the two trading systems, I actually did a, a little trick. I used an A2 trading system. And what I would do, I copy the whole trading system, call it A2 quant for quantity, because we're planning with quantity. By copying the trading system, I can then really compare the two uh, together. So I'm creating a toolbar button for the second one. At the moment, if we look in the formula, it's exactly the same we had before. It's trading 27 lots. And now we're just uh, substituting the fixed number of 27 against the code we have actually created on the on the other side. So on the long end, on the short trade, of course, I'm doing that. So now we can compare the two trading systems. I can keep the um, little ATR study here on, just make that a little bit smaller um, to make sure it, it works correctly. So I'm just applying the A2 quant, the new trading system to it. And uh, as we can see on total numbers, um, th this is a lucky, <laughs> this is probably a lucky occasion here. Uh, the original trading system was fixed uh, 27 lots, made us 110,000, and now with that uh, 2,500 2 risk per trade, it's making 221,000. That looks good on the first place, but <laughs> it doesn't really tell us that this ATR is the greatest thing on earth. It's, uh, uh, it could be coincidence. So to actually compare the two, uh, remember, on the upper one, we're trading fixed 27 lots, and on the lower one, we're trading that ATR function. So and if we look into straight, I'm switching off the original one. Uh, we look in some of those straights. We look at this one. We're trading 18 lots here, for instance. Um, in this case, we're trading 11 lots. And if, uh, in this case, we're trading 13 lots. So it changes the number of traded contracts per trade. As we could now to compare the two trading systems really together from the risk point of view, um, we can do a one little side step here. Uh, we go to the printer icon, we go to uh, tablet trades. Here's all our trades, 176 trades. Here's the size of each trade. And what I would do now, I copy that to the clipboard using Control C. I'm bringing a little Excel sheet up here pasting these number of trades into the Excel sheet. Um, just using these trade numbers, I want to see how much I trade on average in this trading system. So going all the way down to the end of uh, the 176 trades, here we go. Pressing one button to summarize all of that. So on total, we're trading 4,800 contracts. And now just a quick calculation, doing the 4,800 contracts. Uh, divided by 176 trades, so that's roughly about 27 trades. As you can see now, <laughs> it's not coincidence that we came up with 27 
uh, trades. I made the numbers before um, before I started that. So I looked into the result of the risk formula uh, to have a really comparison between the two trading systems. So I did a little bit of reverse engineering. So <laughs> just to show you how to play uh, with those numbers. So get the Excel out of the way, get the tabular trades out of the way, and uh, go back to our formula. So two steps learned from this little section. Um, one, of course, we have an implied risk somewhere in the markets, and we can use that uh, as a calculation of ATR. Actually, the turtles came up with that many years ago. They're using that kind of functionality, uh, measuring ATRs and, and calculating the stop losses. The original turtles actually used two ATRs uh, for their stop losses and things like that. But it's totally up to you how, how you want to use that formula. But it's a very smart way. And the second part I wanted to show uh, just to wrap that up with a first little example here, I want to show how you can build these kind of mathematical formulas in a in a step by step approach that you not um, just need to do the whole code and then on the trading system it trades or it doesn't trade or you get some numbers but you cannot really go in a step by step approach understanding uh, how this is done. I hope that helps a little bit understanding. Uh, how you can help yourself with little test studies and, and things like that. Another little change to this trading system, uh, to this trading system, I would like to do, uh, because that's something that really, really often comes up um, on customer requests, on questions we're getting. So um, the next idea is uh, I want to have a timer, because um, I don't want to trade uh, the whole day on these mini S and P's. I want to limit the trades to certain uh, times a day, and that's our second little example we're doing here. And uh, also, this has a little uh, neat trick inside I'm using. So we have a time function. So I'm using the same trading system as we did before. So using our A2 quant now, not copying that again. I'm just doing the live system. And uh, again, it's our fast moving average crosses above slower moving average that triggers that triggers our trade. And then we want to add another function to it, uh, saying that the time must be between, let's say, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock or something like that. So how to do that? Um, again, going a step aside to the custom studies, um, I call it quickly my time, just to understand how that formula calculates, creating a toolbar button for it. Um, under functions, we have a section called time functions. Here it is. Uh, you have hours, and uh, which is always like line time. Um, and you have the local hour, uh, which is always your time zone you're in. So uh, if I just look at local hour, how this works on the chart, um, I'm just opening the um, my time. Here it is. Just opening the my time study. Hit apply here. And I can see in that chart. Um, the values of that study, uh, just like the first first hour is zero of the day, and then it goes like one, two, three, four, five. So it's a 60-minute chart. We get a value for uh, for each time. So we could simply say in our trading system, um, we trade on the moving average. If the moving average one crosses above moving average two, and hour is greater than three o'clock, and hour is less than five o'clock. But we want to do it a little bit smarter. If you're trading on a five-minute chart or on different time frames, you might want to incorporate minutes as well. And uh, for that reason, I came up with a little, a little neat trick, <laughs> making that a kind of digital clock uh, using the local hour and multiply that by 100 just to get two zero digits behind it. So if I do that, hit apply. Now the time is not represented in, in, in 17 like right now. This is my local time here. Um, it's represented in 1700. And now if I do uh, plus local minute, it would actually add the minute to it. So as we are on the, um, uh, now we're at 1730, which is the time of the last bar. So if you, on a five minute chart, on a one minute chart, on every intraday chart, it would give you the timer of that bar. Again, we used a little custom study to actually develop the piece of code and then we want to use it in the trading system. So I'm copying the whole thing, going back to the trading system, and now I'm introducing a little 
trick here, which is very, very helpful for programming. Before the whole piece of code, uh, I can introduce variables to the system. So I can call that thing timer. And every time I, I uh, create a variable inside the code, uh, I go colon equals. And now the, the code comes in. So this is my calculation, local hour multiplied by 100 plus local minutes. And um, I have to do a semicolon in the back. So it's colon in the front after timer colon equals the calculation and semicolon. So this variable now stores um, into uh, the trading system and I can use it. So now on my backtesting signal, uh, we still have moving average one crosses moving average two. And I can say, and now I'm just simply using the timer um, must be greater than this way around than let's say 12.30. And then could do it again. And timer, oh, sorry, we need to write it the same way. Timer must be less than 17.30. Oh, so 17.30 without colon, of course. So with these two ex extra functions, I'm limiting the number of entries uh, of the long trade uh, to that. Again, I can copy the whole whole thing, use the same trick on the short trade, just before the code introducing the timer, and then limiting the short trades. I'm just too lazy to type it all over again. I'm just limiting the short trades to the same times per day. Insert, and if I hit apply now, our trading system should take off some of the trades and then only trade between certain times of the day, just using that, that little um, functionality here. Just a quick recap. <laughs> um, again, we're using a custom study to actually come up with a code and to actually test and qualify everything on the chart before we uh, use it inside the trading system. And then after we're sure it works, uh, we go into the trading system and we apply the functions. The new thing I introduced is that functionality of getting variables into play. Okay, that was our our second little piece here. Um, I'm going back to that um, initial system to the A2. I leave the timer in here uh, at the end of the uh, of the section of today. I will make a component pack of all the studies of everything we did. And uh, with the recording of the webinar, we'll probably uh, supply the component pack as well for your download. So you don't need to write everything down in a hurry and, and try to recompute it. Um, we're doing a little different uh, scenario. We had quantity and we had timer. Now we're copying the A2, the initial trading system again, and call it A2 once. Because my second example is uh, I want to trade only, um, let's say, once a day or uh, one long and one short trade a day. Or you might have the idea only trading, um, if you're trading breakout systems, for instance, it can happen that you only take the first trade of the day. And you don't want, uh, if, the, if the signal happens again, you don't want the second signal and the third signal. So you can limit um, the, actual, um, the actual times it trades. Again, we're creating a toolbar button for the A21. Uh, we're switching off our quantity system. We put that on. We actually can turn off the, the interim studies we did. So I'm removing in my ATR. don't need any more remove in my time. So we are on the plain starting point again uh, from the study. And as we can see um, here on the chart, this is probably a pretty good example here from today. Um, it trades, if the markets are very thin and the moving areas are very close, it trades multiple times a day. And this is what I want to limit. Going back to formulas, and actually my colleague, Doug Jansen from the States came up with that idea. I had a little bit com more complicated approach when I started with that, uh, but Doug came up with a very, very good idea. Uh, what we can do, um, we, we want to measure at first how many closed entries uh, we have totally on, on our trading system. And we're always thinking from the point when we enter the next trade. So the system wants to enter the next trade. 
And at this point in time, when it enters the next trade, it does that calculation. So um, we introduced the, the uh, variables before, so I can call it again CEC, uh, my operation for closed entry count. Again, we do colon equals. And um, then I look in the formula toolbox under functions. On the very end, there are trading system functions. And here's our closed entry count of this trade. So we're looking at the long trades and the short trades uh, separately here. So I'm just inserting that. And don't forget the, semi, uh, the uh, semicolon at the end. So we have the variable CC uh, into a number. Now the next step would be we want to know the same number, the closed entry count, but at the start of the day. So I call that STA for the start of the day, again, colon equals. And then I'm doing the same trick. I'm, I want to see the closed entry count of the trading system, but only when, at a certain point, I want to store that number. And um, we have this bar index in the functions column. There it is, bar index. If bar index start of day, equals zero. So now we have the CEC, closed entry count total, which is at the point where we want to trade, and we know what was the closed entry count of the beginning of the day. And now it's pretty simple. Um, uh, we can say, okay, the day, how many, oh, don't forget the semicolon, okay. Now we can calculate today, uh, we use the closed entry count, so the number of trades we did um, minus the start of the day entry counts. So at the moment, maybe we are we are 25 trades, and on the start of the day we were 23, but we add the plus one to it because we want to add like one trade at the third variable. That's all variables; they don't do anything yet. Uh, here's our trading signal: if moving average crosses above the other moving average. And then we say, and, again, using the variable, um, the day uh, is uh, less or equal, let's say one, if you only want to allow one trade per day. I don't want to do it for the short side as well. We can, um, we can quickly switch off the short trades. See if that works. Oh yeah, I know what why it's complaining. <laughs> Again, we've got the semicolon here, so now it works. So just quickly switching off the short trades for not being distracted from them. So we're only looking at long trades, and um, now we have like the day for today, and we have only that one trade, and after that, nothing happens. No more trades. And we go back to formula and going back to long trade and allow that number being two. Hit apply again. We see that, that changes a little bit and all of a sudden we get like two trades all of the day. Again, you don't have to remember that a uh, little bit more complex formula in a rush here in the trading system. Um, all these uh, samples are in the traders column, the traders code column, and we will uh, put a little pack on the internet where you can review them as well. That's our search little example. And um, last but not least, I want uh, to add one additional filter to it, uh, another trading rule that comes along with that. Um, and this is very, very short. This is a very, very short thing uh, to do. Um, the idea here is for those who ever wondered in these codes in CQG, if you build some code, we always have that add sign and the code. What does the at sign actually mean? Uh, the at sign or the, um, uh, the, the asterisk as we can call it um, means that whatever you do, whatever code you apply here is applied to whatever chart you have on. So whatever symbol uh, uh, it is, it's using that symbol. So that's a default. If you're using a moving average, you click from the toolbox, of course it comes up with the at sign. Um, but I can also substitute the ad sign by something else. So let's say, again, we're trading mini S&Ps here now. 
And now we're taking only long trades, uh, it eliminated all the short trades on the mini s and But I want to have like a, uh, like a second market assumption if I really want to do that trade. So let's say I only want to trade mini S&Ps if um, the mini NASDAQs are also positive, for instance, or are also in, a, in an uptrend, so for the long trades, for example. And this is really, really simple in CBG. Um We use that trading system again, and I'm just adding another rule to it. I'm saying, and... A moving average, so just looking for studies. Again, I have to scroll down to find the moving averages. Uh, here we go. Used to moving average. Um, this time, let's, yeah, let's change that to a longer period moving average. Let's say we don't want to have a 40 period moving average in here. So, and the 40 period moving average must be pointing up, and we have under special. We have this going up and going down. This just measures the slope of the moving average by two points. So it measures the point of attack when we want to trade, and it measures the point before. So it's just looking at the moving average uh, if this one is going up or down. So as a filter, additional filter on the trading system, I only want to trade if that moving average is pointing up as well. At the moment, there's still the add sign in there, that means it look, it's looking at the mini S&P's moving average. So all I need to do is change that to ENQ, which is the symbol for the mini NASDAQ uh, market, and I only want to trade mini S&P's if the 40 period moving average of the ENQ of the uh, mini NASDAQ is going up as well. And if we hit apply, we should see some changes in the, um, in the outcome of our um, our PL curve here it reduced the um, the winds from 100,000 going down to 50,000 because eventually we filtered out a lot of trades. In this case, maybe we filtered out good trades as well. So the um, uh, the actual money we're making is going down. So this might, for this particular market, not be a very good example. But you can do all kinds of things like that, looking for moving averages or looking for more complex studies. And uh, the only thing you have to remember is substituting the ad sign um, by um, the required market. It could be cross, uh, cross markets, could be European markets, could be US to US, could be Asian markets. Um, just if you do things like that, be very careful, really check the results if it works, if it works correctly on the chart step by step, especially if the markets are not trading at the same times. So if you're looking at DAX that trades only like European hours from eight to eight o'clock, European time frame, and you're checking DAX against uh, something that, that trades only a few hours a day on the U.S. markets. So that could be uh, some discrepancies between the two. So always, if you do cross-market, cross-time frame things, always be very, very careful and always go back into the chart and carefully check that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, to wrap things up, four very, very simple um, ideas what we can do, uh, and as Tom already mentioned, uh, if you go to our website, I think I have that open here. Uh, let me quickly check. Yeah, it's open. Uh, if we go to uh, the website news.cgg.com, so it's not www. It's news.cgg.com, which is our blog website, and uh, you'll find very interesting articles of all kinds. Sometimes it's uh, market um, commentaries, sometimes with some of the uh, Excel and RTD link work Tom does, and uh, sometimes it's backtesting tips coming from uh, the traders column. So they are usually written by me, not all that uh, written by me, but most of them. And all the four examples I showed today, uh, you will find on these, um, on these commentaries for review. And as mentioned before, the seminar will be on in 48 hours, and uh, we'll make sure uh, we get a pack with those four uh, little samples uh, we have done uh, that you can just simply load the, uh, the pack again and see how this is done. I hope this was kind of helpful, and um, I stopped sharing my desktop, and I'm uh, pitching it over back uh, to Tom Hartle in the States. Hey, thanks a lot, Helmut. That was a really nice presentation. Um, we have a question on one customer is asking about, can you set the risk to not be a fixed dollar amount, but a percentage of the account value? 
Um, unfortunately, that's not possible. You, um, you have to have a fixed amount um, because you're creating an infinite loop if you do so, because um, the trading system results would be ca uh, counted back into the formula, and uh, that's unfortunately not possible in CPG at the point in time. Okay. Um, well, that was our only uh, question. Again, appreciate your time. Um, this concludes our webinar. Again, you can go to news.cqg.com and click on Trader's Code, and you can see all of Helmut's uh, articles, uh, very well detailed, and we will be uh, posting the pack, and uh, this uh, webinar will, you know, is recorded and will be posted within 48 hours, and you'll receive a link to the recording via email. Thank you again, everyone, and again, thank you very much, Helmut. Uh, thank you, John, and thanks for listening in. Bye-bye. Okay.